so um, I just thought I'd start by um, just outlining what I want to tell you about today. So first of all, it's probably, um, you know, preaching to the already converted, but I'll tell you a little bit about why birds matter and, and why they're interesting to so many of us. And then um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on how it is, where I come from, and how I became interested in um, the questions that I'm going to be talking to you largely today about, or this evening. Um, but before I kick into all of that, I'll spend a little bit of time also introducing you to freshwater habitats because of, you know, you're a very general audience, and so some of you may not be so familiar with freshwater habitats as as um, as some of us, um, like myself, might be. And then finally, I'll go on to talk about um, um, how our knowledge is now growing about how birds do really contribute to freshwater biodiversity. So that's what I'm hoping to cover tonight. So to begin with, why do birds matter? Well, as I'm sure most of you recognize, they're diverse. There are more than 10,000 species. They come in many shapes and sizes and um, perform various different functions. And they're ubiquitous. We see them everywhere. And because they're big, they're really evident to us. And so, you know, they are riveting to us and we, um, they draw our attention. So because of those things, I think that means that they have contributed to things that we now lump as cultural services. So they contribute to um, art and religion, and of course, to the kinds of leisure activities like many of you, I think, are involved with. They also perform provisioning services for, um, for us in terms of providing food, the poultry industry, eggs, and so on, um, and also providing guano, which has been long used for fertilization purposes. Um, and they provide important ecosystem services as well. So they um, have scavenging roles, they um, can um, undertake pest control, contribute to nuclear nutrient cycling. But um, the thing that I really want to stress tonight is how they act as mobile links. And when I was um, preparing this talk, I decided I was just going to Google, why do birds matter into, um, onto the internet? And I came up with this wonderful um, website that some of you might want to Google in the future. If you just type why do birds matter or why birds matter, you'll come up to this Audubon Society website. And Jackie Bonomo, who um, is the executive director apparently and vice pre president of the Audubon Maryland DC uh, branch, um, has the perfect quote for this talk. She said, birds are the FedExes of the natural world. They bring nature to people wherever we are, sitting on a porch, hiking, in a wheelchair by a window, birds are almost nearly always there, and as such, so is nature. And I thought that was just a really great way to kick into this talk because they're mobile links. Nearly all birds fly. They often fly in big, huge numbers like this image shows on the right there. And many fly great distances. And this is another thing that I stumbled across when I was putting this talk together. I should mention that this talk um, was scheduled to be given um, last March, um, just before things got locked down and we all decided it probably wasn't a good time for everybody to travel into central London on the, on the underground. So um, it's been delayed until now. But back in February, look at this fantastic um, image uh, taken by, uh, it's a radar image of birds migrating from South America across the Florida Keys. So all these green and yellow dots are millions of birds that were um, captured by radar. And as you can see, they took hours to fly over Key West, which is a station down in the Florida Keys. And they measured about 90 uh, miles in circumference on this, on this um, radar tracing. So they, large numbers move around a lot and they move great distances. And here's another nice image that um, I got um, courtesy of some colleagues of mine at the British Trust for Ornithology. Um, and these are um, counts of common teal that are taken in, um, in May in 2015. And these red dots are an indication of how many birds the, the birdie, birdie types were. I mean, some of you might have been collecting these data yourself. I don't know. Um, so you can see that in May, they were present across Europe, uh, but mostly in Scandinavia and way up here at the top of Norway and so on. 
Um, and the size of these um, circles indicates how many birds were counted. And you can see that come October, they've started to move down, they're migrating south, and you've got these really huge numbers of um, birds um, down in, in more central parts of Europe, and they're starting to you know, enter Italy and so on. So birds fly around a lot and they move long distances. Oops. Um, so a little bit about me then. Um, so I grew up in California, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm not a local to the UK. Um, and in fact, I grew up um, along uh, in a house that was above this beach here. Um, and I was very familiar with um, what, you know, things you could find in the tide pools, snails, sea anemones, crabs, and so on. And then I um, uh, grew up and, oops, why did that happen? Um, I want to go backwards. I'll use this instead. Okay, so um, uh, when I uh, grew up and discovered that there were other really intriguing things besides the obvious things that you find in tide pools, like um, these fantastic uh, colonial animals called bryozoans, which live on kelp fronds and underneath rocks. I became a PhD student at the University of California in Berkeley to study the ecology of these much more strange and fascinating um, invertebrates um, to, me, to me. So um, that's what I did. And then some years later, I did, uh, after a couple of postdocs, I went to the University, University of Oxford, where I was based at Magdalen College. And I began working on freshwater relatives of, the, of those marine bryozoans that I'd worked on as a PhD student. And so here you can see some of those um, lovely bryozoans here. I'll introduce you, them to you a, a bit more. Um, but one of the things that struck me immediately from moving from working on a marine system to freshwater systems um, is that freshwater systems are really weird because if you live in the ocean, um, like uh, the west coast of Ireland here, you're surrounded by this huge ocean that surrounds you. Um, but if you're in a freshwater system, you're in some place, some place like this, where you've got this huge terrestrial environment all around you, uh, places that you can't live. So that seemed to me like really different and distinct and new. And how is it that these animals and plants, you know, can make a go in living in these kinds of habitats? Um, and you'll see a little bit more in a, in a few minutes. So I'm going to um, now introduce you a, a little bit more to, to freshwater systems. Um, so unlike marine environments, which cover most of the surface of the earth and then terrestrial environments, freshwater environments are really relatively scarce. They only cover 3% of the earth's surface. But those 3% um, of the earth's surfaces environments are really important. They, of course, are the source of fresh water for ourselves for, um, and for various other animals. Um, and um, they provide habitats of, of very different um, types all around the world. And this is a slide just showing you some of the freshwater habitats that I've had the, um, the, the, um, the good fortune to go and do research in, for example, in South Africa and Borneo and Brazil and so on, and other ones where I've just happened to be lucky and go on a, on a um, as a tourist to visit. So they're very important habitats, um, but yet they're very, they comprise a very small part of the Earth's surface. But the amazing thing is that they harbor a really disproportionate number of species, of the described species that we know about. Um, so for example, in terms of um, vertebrates, they, the freshwater habitats globally contain 25% of all vertebrate species. And yet they, you know, as I say, only um, comprise 3% of their surfaces. And most of those species are fish. So they're really biodiverse places. And one of the puzzles about freshwater habitats that made me really get hooked on them is that these habitats change over time. So we know, I think you probably can appreciate that lakes and ponds gradually disappear. Um, as the vegetation surrounding the lakes encroaches into those lakes and grows around the edges. See, I'm used to going like this, and now I have to go like this with my pointer and, and talk you through these, these images. So you have vegetation coming in and, and then soil runoff and 
and eventually those lakes are going to disappear. And rivers also change courses. So um, this is a, a nice old map that a map that I managed to find of showing the Mississippi River and the different courses that the Mississippi River has taken over the years down in the region of New Orleans and in the in the south um, as it enters the Gulf of Mexico. So freshwater environments are not static; they are constantly changing, um, and um, that those changes also include uh, biotic changes, eutrophication with nutrient enrichment is very common, where you get algal blooms and and the and the water clarity changes. Man imposes. This is very jumping ahead of itself. Uh, man can um, put dams in and you know cause massive changes. There are also invasive species that are um, that are transported now increasingly more with um, with um, movement by humans and and diseases can come in as well. So for example, spring viremia of carp. So both biotic and abiotic conditions change over time. So these environments are not static and yet they have high uh, biodiversity. Um, so what happens? I mean, here are these animals and plants that are adapted to living under certain kinds of conditions. And as those conditions change, they might need to get out of those sites to locate a new site, which offers the, the kinds of conditions that they actually require. And yet freshwater environments are surrounded by this hostile terrestrial landscape um, that surrounds them. So if the inhabitants are stuck in a place that's deteriorating over time, they need to get to a new place. Um, and they do that by dispersal. So this dispersal to new sites is really critical for the regional persistence of freshwater species to locate the kinds of places that um, they require. Um, and that dispersal will then contribute to the distributions of species across um, habitats that, that we see. And of course, that in turn will determine the composition of communities that we see within freshwater bodies. So um, dispersal is really important for distributions, persistence regionally as these habitats are changing, and it influences the composition of the community that, are, that we see there. So the thing about dispersal is that um, all organisms can't disperse equally. So here I've put together a little cartoon image of three sites, A, B, and C um, in blue, and uh, some um, little figures of the sorts of things that might uh, want to get to these different sites. And so things that have um, um, wings and can fly uh, might be quite capable of getting to these different sites, birds and insects and so on. But things that crawl or hop slowly, um, those might have a much harder um, time getting from site to site, and that will become increasingly harder as the distances between those sites um, becomes larger. And of course, then there's this whole slew of these other things, all these things um, that live within the lakes and ponds, zooplankton, little benthic snails, um, plants that live around the edges, algal cells, and so on, lots of those things are just um, not going to um, make it to those new sites. Um, let me just, okay, so, so we have this inherent um, um, difference in how things are able to disperse. Um, and yet we do find that we have diverse freshwater communities that are present across the landscape. And so that was really the question that interested me when I began to work on freshwater environments. If you live in an ocean and you're bathed in this big ocean, there doesn't seem to be um, as great a hindrance in terms of getting around. But if you're stuck in a lake or a pond somewhere, you know, how do you get to a new site if you can't get there, there yourself? And this was also a question that um, taxed Darwin. So he highlighted this conundrum of how can we explain the widespread distribution of freshwater organisms um, that we clearly see when we go out and look at our lakes and ponds. And so he speculated that, well, maybe ducks play a potential role in transporting freshwater mollusks around on their feet or on their feathers. And so really, it's been ever since Darwin that we've still been struggling with the question of how thing, freshwater organisms that can't disperse themselves, how do they get to new sites? And 
um, understanding the dispersal of freshwater organisms by water birds that Darwin speculated about um, still remains very much of a challenge. So I'm just going to introduce you to the term zoochory. This is a term um, that refers to dispersal by animal vectors, which is what we're talking about here now. And zoochory can happen when things are transported on external surfaces, like you can see the dog on the, on the upper image there with those burrs stuck in it. And you, those of you who have dogs, uh, you know, you might appreciate that you're having to pull out these things as you, you know, take them home after a walk. Um, so plants are trying to use that um, dog as an animal vector to get somewhere good for their feed. Um, but you can also have um, dispersal when seeds and fruits and things are ingested by animals. And, and for example, birds um, will ingest fruits and so on. Those seeds might survive in the digestive tract and get excreted, excreted into a new environment. And so this is the issue that I want to now talk about. What is the evidence for zoochory? of freshwater invertebrates by water birds. We know now there's been quite a lot of work looking at zoochory um, of fruits and seeds in a terrestrial environment by birds and monkeys and various vertebrates um, in a, a terrestrial setting, but, um, but uh, less evidence for water birds in terms of freshwater invertebrates. So that's what I want to spend time talking about now. So we're going to now focus on dispersal of freshwater invertebrates by water birds. And I'm going to introduce you to the study systems that I'll talk to you about. I mean, the first one are these fantastic invertebrates called bryzoans, which you can see here on um, several different um, images of bryzoans on the right-hand side. Um, so I'll introduce you though to those in a little bit more in the next slide. Um, but I'm also going to warn you that I also have been looking at whether bryzoans and the parasites that they have um, may also be dispersed along with those bryzoans, and those parasites are called mixosomes. So I'm warning you that I'm going to tell you about two fairly unusual groups of invertebrates um, that are going to be the stars of the show really here. Um, and these are what mixosomes are. They, um, they um, develop as, as sacs inside the bryzoans, and here you can see some of these sacs that have um, been um, burst out of the bryzoan host. But I'll tell you a bit more about those in a bit. Let's focus on bryzoans first. So here are some freshwater bryzoans. They're colonial inverte invertebrates. So they form these spreading colonies that um, look like this. So here's a colony growing across a surface. And if we blew that up, this is a one centimeter scale bar here. If we blow that up, it would look something like this. And you can see they have these fantastic um, tentacular crowns that they push out into the water column and they create feeding currents, and those then um, are used for, for feeding. Um, and they um, feed on um, members of the, um, of the plankton. So they use, those they use those tentacular crowns for feeding on tiny suspended particles. And you can see those crowns there. Um, and bryzoans um, are also, uh, you know, they tend to live in, um, on the bottoms of boats where they foul the, the bottom of the boats. Um, they live underneath rocks. They live on tree roots and branches that fall into rivers and lakes and so on. But in growing, during the growing season, they can grow as these extensive um, colonies that actually can foul pipes and um, foul water intakes. And here's an example of a bryzoan that you can see, well, many bryzoan colonies that have grown all over this um, pump system in a, in a lake here that's being held up. So they actually can cause fouling problems um, and are becoming a nuisance in a number of freshwater supply systems. So they have a kind of an applied issue as well. I need to tell you a little bit about their life history so you can understand now where we're going and what I'm going to tell you about. So they produce these, these kind of um, seed-like structures that are called statoblasts. And these are highly resistant dormant stages. They're, all, they're small, about one millimeter in dimension. Um, and so you can see some statoblasts developing here within this colony. When they're mature, they become this brownish tan color. Um, here's an, an old colony just packed full of statoblasts and a bunch that have been released from colonies. Um, and these statoblasts are 
dormant and they're very resistant to extreme conditions. So they survive desiccation, high temperatures, uh, low pHs. And so these properties mean that they're able to resist things like we think, and I'll show you evidence, to resist things like passing through digestive tracts of vertebrates, um, living on the external surfaces and not drying out if they're stuck on mud or stuck in the feathers of birds and so on. And when those statoblasts are uh, mature, they will hatch into a new colony. So look, there's a cute little baby bryzoan that's just coming out of this statoblast that's hatched there. So they establish a new bryzoan colony that then can grow and spread into a larger colony during the growing season. So the question I want to talk about is, are these statoblasts transported by water birds? And one last thing to point out, which is kind of um, a nice thing that makes them really good study organisms to focus on, is that up at the top here, I've mentioned that these are asexual propagules. So they're genetically identical to the bryzoan colony that produced them, to the parent bryzoan that produced them. The genetic, they're genetically identical to those. And that's quite a nice trait because then we can infer potentially dispersal by linking bryzoans at different sites. If we're really lucky, we may be able to find genetically identical bryzoans even at different sites. And I'll show you some evidence for that in a bit. So one of the stars of the show is going to be um, this particular bryzoan called Christotella musedo which was illustrated by Almond in a famous figure that he um, produced in 1856. It looks a bit like a caterpillar, and you can maybe appreciate that a bit more here. Um, so these colonies are uh, three or four centimeters in dimensions, and here you can see a one a little bit closer up. And here are the statoblasts that Christotella produces. You can see them here, and in Almond's picture here and here. And maybe you can just about make out that at the tips of these spines there are these little grappling hooks that make them really good for getting snagged onto these things. Um, and so is there evidence for Zocori for Christotella? Well, the first evidence is that yes, we actually do find them um, snagged onto um, feathers of birds. So you might be able to um, see that this is a scanning electron micrograph of statoblasts that are all stuck in the um, feathers of this, of this bird here. And here's a feather that I found in Norfolk. And all of these little black things are statoblasts that are stuck onto that feather. So they're really good at sticking to feathers. Um, but we also now know that these statoblasts can be ingested and they will hatch after they've been collected from the feces that the birds defecate after they've eaten those statoblasts. So this is a paper that came out um, a number of years ago, actually, um, from a group in, based in um, the Netherlands, where they fed 500 statoblasts of Christotella, whoops, sorry about that, 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 I, um, that I gave to this group. So we sent them Christotella statoblasts, and they fed the statoblasts to Pintail and, sorry, Pintail and Shoveler, and found that some of those statoblasts were able to hatch after they collected them from being deprecated. So since that study, there's been a number of further studies that um, um, have found statoblasts in the feces of water birds. And many of those studies have been conducted by this character here, Andy Green, um, who I've known for a number of years. Um, so he's found stat um, statoblasts of various bryzoans uh, um, and other invertebrates and plants. So he doesn't look just at bryzoans, but at plant seeds and in um, dormant stages of um, uh, water fleas, cladocerins, and other invertebrates. Um, and in this particular study, he was looking at black swan, Eurasian coot, and, and gray teal. And um, he not only counts those seeds, but he often um, uh, sees whether they can, um, uh, how, you know, that they're intact and so on. And so he found intact propagules of various invertebrates, plants, and bryzoans in these um, three bird species. Um, and this is a more recent study by um, Andy Green and Casper Van Leeuwen and so on, which has even found evidence for secondary dispersal by great cormorants. And so what they found is that they, in the regurgitated um, pellets from great um, cormorants, they actually found statoblasts of five freshwater bryzoan species. And 
they retrieved those statoblasts and found that those statoblasts in the seeds would, would hatch. And of course, cormorants, as I think most of you will be um, familiar with, they're probably not feeding directly on these things. They're feeding on fish, and the fish would have been the things that ingested these um, statoblasts and seeds and so on. So you, you can get these kind of secondary dispersal events by um, piscivorous birds that are dispersing um, the, the seeds that the fish themselves have ingested. So you can, it's a bit like a Russian doll effect, really. So how far might dispersal by water birds um, work? And in order to answer that question, you need to think about how long the retention time might be in the, in the guts of the birds. And so going back to the first study that the, um, that the Dutch co colleagues did, they found that most of the Christotella statoblasts that we sent to them were retained for four hours, but they did find that maximum retention times where they would collect intact stato statoblasts, um, some of them, of course, will be crushed up and so on, but we're talking about intact things that could potentially hatch. And they found that maximum retention times were 44 and 32 hours in pintail and shoveler, um, respectively. So that tells you how long they could potentially be kept in the gut. So then if you want to think about how far statoblasts might go, you need to think about the bird flight times, the speeds, and the distances that those birds have traveled. And so um, I found a study by Miller et al, who um, a, was a telemetry study looking at a nonstop flight of an individual northern pintail, which went nearly 300 kilometers over 38 hours. And so that's within this time frame of how long they could potentially disperse something if they didn't defecate over that time period. And I found an average ground speed for pintail of 77 kilometers per hour. So um, that would mean that they could potentially have been dispersed on the order of about 3,000 kilometers over 38 hours. Well, of course, many birds are going to have stopover sites and they may defecate there. So you could get, you know, a series of hops and jumps um, for things to um, travel different distances. But it just sort of shows you what kind of potential dispersal is possible and how long things can re remain within these digestive tracts over those kinds of time periods. So those, those sorts of um, mental exercises made my colleague, Tim Wood, who you can see in the yellow t-shirt there, who works on Bryce Owen, speculate that the, the very widespread and apparently disjunct um, dispersal uh, distributions that we see of freshwater bryozoans in different continents, um, that these um, distributions might be explained by these very large flyways that you get um, dis um, displayed by some of these birds that travel very great distances. So there are some bryozoans that are the same species that have these disjunct distributions on different continents, and maybe we can explain them by these sorts of widespread dispersal events. So another way that we can look at um, evidence for dispersal is to look for um, genetic signatures of that. And that's some work that I've been involved with for a number of years now. And this was a study that I conducted with, um, with some colleagues where we were collecting Christotella along uh, waterfowl migratory work, uh, routes in, um, across Europe. And we then were able to genotype the colonies collected in these different sites um, and this map on the left shows you that we went to 14 different sites in the UK and across Europe. Um, and we uh, um, collected bryozoan colonies and then genotyped them and analyzed them for how related they were to each other. And then that work enabled us to show that we could detect low le levels of gene flow that linked these populations across um, these, these regions across Europe. Um, so showing that these populations, there is a certain level of genetic relatedness indicating these low levels of gene flow. But a really fun thing was that we found these two sites, one in the Netherlands and one in Sweden, where we had identical clonal genotypes. And if you remember, I was saying that these um, statoblasts that are produced by the bryozoans are genetically identical to the, to the parent colony that produced them. And so that indicates to us that we had a very recent event where the same genetic stock was transported 
in, in either one direction or the other, from the Netherlands to, um, oops, I'm afraid this, when I use my pointer, it makes the slides jump forward. Um, uh, so anyway, that was a really nice finding that we could show that um, same genotype in these distinct um, and very distant places separated by hundreds of kilometers. Subsequent to that, um, Andy Green and his colleagues um, published a nice paper um, saying that invertebrate eggs can fly. And so whoops, uh, what they did was to take band recovery data and they found that, um, that they could link the band recovery data with genetic distance and gene flow of these Pisatella populations across the US that, uh, that my colleagues at NILI had, had identified. So, so that was a nice study that showed that band recovery data could be linked with the genetic um, um, relationships amongst those um, populations. Okay, so I now want to go on to talk about the question of can parasites co-disperse along with the things that are being dispersed by these birds. So I've provided you with some evidence that um, waterfowl um, look capable of dispersing freshwater bryozoans. The sataplasts live through the, the gut, they hatch. Um, we have low levels of gene flow and even finding the same clones of, um, of bryozoans across migratory uh, waterfowl routes and so on. Um, so there's a building picture of evidence in support of waterfowl dispersing of these um, bryozoans. But what about the parasites? So I'm going to introduce you a little bit more to uh, mixozoan parasites. So here is a bryozoan, and you can see these little white sacs developing in it. Here's the crown of tentacles without and not inverted here. The sacs, you can burst out of the bryozoans. And these sacs are full of thousands and thousands of tiny little spores that you can see here. Um, and mixozoans, I'll just mention in passing, are an amazing group of parasites that turn out to be very closely related to jellyfish. So they're relatives of things like corals and sea anemones and jellyfish. And there's this whole radiation of mixozoans that we now know live as parasites in bryozoans and vertebrates and other invertebrates. And so I'm talking to you about, um, about um, these kinds of parasites. And what we know about mixozoans is that they have complex life cycles, so they exploit multiple hosts. Um, and bryozoans are a host that, um, invertebrate host that these mixozoans use. So here's an infected bryozoan with these sacs. Those spores from those bryozoans are released into the water, and those spores then um, will uh, attach to fish. The fish become infected, and the fish in turn release spores into the water that infect bryozoans. The common name for bryozoan is moss animals, by the way. So that's the complex life cycle of the mixozoan that uses bryozoans as invertebrate hosts. And we'll come back to that in a bit. Um, so we do have evidence that these mixozoans can co-disperse with their bryozoan host because we can um, use molecular tools to look at whether sataplasts are infected. And the, the answer is yes, sataplasts of this uh, bryozoan, Fredricella, um, and here's the sataplasts. We do find that parasite, that mixozoans are infecting those sataplasts. And in fact, uh, about a third of the sataplasts that we sampled in bryozoan populations from these two rivers, the River Avon and the River Dunn, um, about a third of the sataplasts collected from those bryozoan populations are infected. So that's a pretty high proportion of the bryozoan um, sataplasts that are infected. And of those sataplasts, we can keep them in the dark and in the cold for um, a while in a, freeze, in, a, in a refrigerator. And then after um, a certain period of time on those, in those wintertime conditions, we can take them back out into warm environments and induce those sataplasts to hatch. And we found that you know, very high proportions of those infected sataplasts are able to hatch. So they're viable. 94 and 100% of sataplasts collected from the River Avon and the Dunn were infected. And um, these two characters on the right down below are um, my colleagues, Hannah and Innes, who were really important in helping me to look at this question of um, infection of um, dynamics in bryozoan populations. And I just thought I'd throw this image in. This shows you a duck 
that's eating uh, a, a big gelatinous colony of rhizomes. You can see some of these rhizomes can be huge. It's kind of floating here. And you can just imagine this is a smaller version lift to this surface. So, so this is a small version of this. And here's a duck that's just gobbling its way across the surface of this colony. And here's the surface of the, pe of the pectinatella bryzoan colony. And all these black things are statoblasts, which look like that up close. So you can imagine that the duck nibbling away across the surface of that statoblast is going to be eating a lot of statoblasts. And if something like a third of those statoblasts are infected, you know, it's potentially going to be eating a lot of infected statoblasts. So the question next is, are statoblasts permissive? If the bryozoans are infected and they can hatch out of those statoblasts, will you get a, an infection developing in those bryozoans? And can that infection then be transmitted on to the fish? Um, and so the answer, um, and, in that, and in this case, the really interesting question is, if so, if can it be transmitted back further onto those fish? Because um, in the case of this um, particular species, Bredrichella, which we've been now focusing on, this bryozoan that hosts this mixozoan infection, this particular species of um, mixozoan goes on to cause a really devastating disease of fish that's called proliferative kidney disease. So the question is, can infected bryozoans um, that are ingested by birds, then hatch, and then go on to develop an infection and um, infect fish. So here we have our infected statoblast. Um, what happens is the, um, we do find that, yes, the, the, statoblast, the, infected, the infection does get transmitted to the bryozoan. The bryozoan grows and develops into a colony. And you can see that um, these sacs will develop into that colony. Um, and those sacs will then release spores. Those spores will go into the environment, and those spores then will have the capacity to produce proliferative kidney disease, which you can see. Here's a, um, a, a rainbow trout cut open to show this very swollen kidney that um, is um, the result of proliferative kidney disease. So what happens is the fish mount this really strong immune response to the presence of the parasite in the kidney, and you get these, this great massive swelling of the kidney. Um, so a little bit more about um, proliferative, ki proliferative kidney disease, or PKD. So what is it? Well, PKD uh, is a disease of all salmon. All salmon and trout seem to be susceptible to the disease. So it's a disease of both farmed and wild fish. And it was first detected in fish farms. This is a farm um, here in the right-hand corner, um, Trafalgar Fisheries down in Wiltshire, which I've um, spent a lot of time um, working on, um, on their system there. Um, the interesting thing about PKD is that um, there have been northern outbreaks in wild fish populations. There was a severe outbreak um, causing lots of mortality of Atlantic salmon in a Norwegian river where they were experiencing warmer temperatures. And there's also um, been an outbreak in Iceland, uh, which is linked with dwindling Arctic char populations. And these, this has also been linked with warmer temperatures. So here are the, um, the two uh, localities where these outbreaks have occurred in regions that previous to the outbreaks, uh, PKD was not detected in. Um, so the outbreaks are increasing in, um, in new locations um, in more northerly regions. And they're also just becoming more evident in wild pop fish populations across Europe and North America. So the implications is that these outbreaks might be explained because infected bryozoans are widespread. And ultimately, it's the, probably the movement of water birds that are contributing to the distribution of parasites, explaining how infections can be you know, widespread across the northern hemisphere. What I will say. Um, which, which I've outlined here, is that uh, PKD, PKD outbreaks whoops, um, are driven by environmental change. So birds can transport the parasite around, but the outbreaks tend to happen when the temperatures warm up, the fish become stressed, more susceptible to the disease outbreaks. And as the environment changes, this seems to be um, what's happening more and more. 
So um, I put the tip of the iceberg here because um, we're now finding that um, mixozoan parasites, uh, the diversity of mixozoans infecting bryozoans and fish is expanding. Um, and so we're finding that infections of statoblasts is common. We're finding um, um, that whoops, bryozoans, uh, there are some 11 species of bryozoans now that we've found to be infected, um, including um, some of those, including their statoblasts. And we're finding um, fish, uh, an, a greater number of fish to be infected, not just salmonids, which are the hosts for PKD, but various cyprinids and, and persids and so on in Europe um, that are, we now are detecting um, in the kidney infections caused by mixozoans that we know use bryozoans as hosts. So we may be, um, it may be that more and more fish will come, will provide symptomatic disease as the environment changes, much like we're finding with PKD. Um, we, we don't know. So it's just, you know, it may be that some of these fish will start to show symptoms of infection. And of course, um, that would then bring uh, water birds into the situation because infections are in different kinds of water bodies into different river systems and so on, are likely going to be transported there by the movements of birds, which are carrying around statoblasts that carry infections. So that is likely the, so the ultimate source of the broad distributions of, of infections, if that in indeed is what um, we end up finding to be the case. So, uh, we have this growing evidence that water brood movements affect dispersal of freshwater organisms with limited dispersal ca capacity, like bryozoans and the parasites that are infecting them. And in fact, that led me uh, fairly recently to put together this, um, this uh, paper that kind of is a review about water bird media dis dispersal um, and freshwater um, this biodiversity, which um, you can see there on the left. Um, so what are the consequences of dispersal by water birds? Well, I hope that you can now begin to appreciate that, that this movement of things by water birds is going to impact biodiversity, that birds moving things around are going to influence dispersal of bryozoans and their mixozoan parasites. This will impact their distributions and hence the structures of communities that we see in different places that in turn um, of course, will influence food webs because bryozoans are primary consumers. So birds may ultimately be introducing bry bryozoans somewhere and they may be introducing parasites of bryozoans. So therefore parasites of uh, the bryozoan populations and the fish populations in those sites. And this, I just thought I'd throw this in. It's a nice picture of um, a food web in Lake Mead that shows you here is bryozoans, which are part of this benthic macroinvertebrate um, scheme of uh, within the food web here, which are prey to various fish, the fish in turn being prey um, to various other fish and to birds, which might then be dispersing um, the fish and the bryozoans and the statoblasts that my, my, they might be eating and so on. But you know, food webs are complex. And so that's just the whole part of that food web. What about other potential impacts of birds? Well, um, there is evidence that many of you probably uh, appreciate that birds also are involved with disease transmission. So they can cause zoonoses, which is spreading disease from animals to humans. Um, and we've known for some time that birds spread avian influenza um, and other agents causing human disease, for example, cryptococcus and, and um, campyl camp campylobacteriosis. Um, and so they can spread um, disease to humans. Um, but they also, it seems clear, can spread diseases of other animals, not just to humans. So they can spread avian tuberculosis to pigs. They're implicated in the spread of foot and mouth disease to cattle. And as I've shown you here, potentially in the spread of PKD to salmon and trout. So they can also spread diseases to humans and to um, fish and so on. Um, and so then that leads us to a sort of a more practical um, view of what um, birds uh, may ultimately impact on, and that is agriculture and fisheries. 
So proliferative kidney disease, as I've been telling you about, is a disease of salmon and trout. Um, and it's now beginning to be a real problem in aquaculture. So Pacific Seafood, um, which is in the Pacific Northwest on the Columbia River, uh, have been in touch with uh, myself and other colleagues. Um, they've been losing about 70% of trout in some of the pens in, um, in one month. And this has continued to be a problem in, in recent summer months. Um, and that's really impacting um, their, um, the loss of trout from these um, pens. And then therefore, you know, the, their, um, their profits. Um, also in the Yellowstone River in Montana, there was a huge fish kill in 2016 that was impacting several different species of, um, of trout within that river system and was estimated to lose about 500,000 US dollars um, in that river system, which is a big system for fishermen to go fish during the summer. Um, and so in fact, what that led to was they actually closed the entire Yellowstone River for the whole summer to fishing. Um, and it's been uh, an ongoing problem in the Yellowstone River since then. And so these kinds of big aquaculture and fisheries impacts have led to PKD workshops here in the UK that I've been involved with developing and in the UK and the USA that I've been um, over with to, um, to interact with various academics and fisheries biologists um, federal and state fisheries biologists and fish farmers, where we're trying to, you know, understand the sources of these diseases, the disease, and and how they might be able to control it. And of course, then, if aquaculture is being impacted, then that has an impact on food security because wild fisheries are de declining, and aquaculture is really viewed to um, be something that. Um, is going to be potentially rescuing the declines in um, in fisheries from the wild fisheries, which is I think this gray line here, and this is the increase in food supply from aquaculture, which you can see is increasing over the over the years. So um, so the food sector um, is really hoping that aquaculture is going to grow and grow. And here we have a disease with PKD that is causing uh, you know a major problem to some of the the aquaculture. Um, uh, fish farmers and, and fish production. So to conclusions then, um, I hope that I've convinced you that thrive zones have provided a really excellent model system for studying dispersal by water birds. Um, they provide us with insights on how a community composition and fish disease agents might be impacted by um, the movements of birds. Um, but as I've tried to indicate, there's also other people like Andy Green and various other colleagues who've been also showing that water birds can carry around other propagules of um, things like um, water fleas and ostracods, uh, crustaceans, even mollusks. There's some evidence that mollusks can um, be, um, small mollusks can be um, dispersed intact by water birds. Um, so many of these invertebrates and plants may be like, reliant on water birds to um, reach these new habitats as their own habitats are changing with environmental change. And so water, bo water bird movements are very likely to enable many organisms to locate suitable habitats um, in our changing world. And I would like to close by just acknowledging uh, various support from funding agencies, uh, the Natural Environment Research Council here in the UK and the uh, BBSRC and other research council, uh, my institute, the Natural History Museum, and various other institutes for funding over the years. Really important people, PhD student Innes, a postdoc, Joanna was the one who did, has done all that lovely genetic work with me. Um, Hannah Hartikainen uh, was a PhD student and another subsequent postdoc looking at populations of infected bryozoans um, with Innes and myself and infections of satablasts and so on. And Paolo has been doing more population genetic work on on bryozoans and finding infections of statoblasts and Christatella, which I forgot to mention. And my husband, Peter, who's been helping me over the years and lots of sampling. So um, that's the end of the show. I'm going to stop my um, screen sharing now and hand it back. I think I'm going to turn on the lights because it's very dark. It's got very dark in my office here. Um, 
and then um, I guess Robert's going to take over for um, for um, from now on. <laughs>